<clears throat> okay, some people are still joining, but we're going to start. Um, shalom to Kulam. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Gross. Uh, I'm a senior fellow here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. And this is our regular weekly uh, event on Zoom that we hold in English uh, for uh, English speakers in Israel and, of course, people around the world. And every week we have, um, I'm joined by uh, a guest with whom I discuss uh, a topic um, of interest to us here in Israel, whether it's about Israeli politics or the Jewish world or, as is the case today, uh, the wider Middle East. Um, and today we're going to be uh, concluding this little mini series that we've been doing on uh, on the developments uh, with Iran and the JCPOA, the new American administration. Um, when we started this series a few weeks ago, of course, this was the this was one of the main this was probably the main topic, the main Middle East topic in the news. Um, sadly, that is not the case at the moment, of course. Uh, because the main topic is what's happening right here in Israel. Um, so I'm just going to say what I said last week, which is that in the event, unlikely event, I hope, that there is a, a siren during this um, event, then uh, I will, uh, in, if, here in Jerusalem, then I will have to leave, <laughs> leave this, this uh, space and run to the shelter here. And we'll uh, return after a few, after a few minutes, hopefully. And um, my guest is, I think, sitting in Tel Aviv. Um, so the same goes for for him. If there's if there is a siren there, so we'll hopefully we won't have to co to, to contend with that. But it's let's put it out there at the beginning, just so that we're not surprised. Um, okay. So uh, for those of you that, that are new to this, um, I'm going to speak with our guest for uh, 20, 30 minutes or so and then turn the floor over to you, our audience, to write your questions into the chat, um, and I'll select a few of those to put to our guests. So, um, having discussed in previous meetings on Iran, both the JCPLA itself and the, the um, approach of the new Biden administration, the likely response of Israel, to, to a uh, newly signed agreement. Um, and in our last discussion, also talking about Israel's actions, military actions, covert actions, um, cyber actions to thwart and, and disrupt the military, the um, nuclear, Iran's nuclear efforts. We're going to turn now to Iran itself um, and a look at what's going on uh, inside the regime, and there really is no better person to do that uh, than my guest today, uh, Mayor Javadan Farr, uh, who is an Iranian-born Israeli lecturer, author, and commentator. He's been teaching Iranian politics at the IDC Herzliya since 2012. He's the co-author of the biography of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, former president of Iran, um, uh, the title of which is The Nuclear Sphinx of Tehran, which has been published in four languages. He's also published many articles on Iran and Iran-related matters for foreign affairs, Al Monitor, The Guardian, The Diplomat, and many others. He's also a commentator, regular commentator on I-24 News. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Mayor Javed Amfar. Mayor, nice Thank to see you. Much. Thank you very much, Paul. It's wonderful to be with you and with everybody else. I'm sorry I can't see everybody. This, we are living in uh, special times, but uh, this is the best that we can do for now. So, um, yes, ne next next year in Jerusalem. Next year um, in Jerusalem really does sound uh, wonderful. Um, okay, let's let's start with um, with a sort of broad question. Um, I think a lot of people looking from the outside look at Iran and they they think of Iran as a as a theocracy as um, as a as an authoritarian regime and they look at it as this kind of monolithic regime and of course in reality as is the case in most most countries even authoritarian ones there are many different competing factions and we hear sometimes about moderates 
and conservatives or pragmatists and hardliners or these different names that are given to the different political factions. Can you say, can you explain that for us? Can you say something about those divisions? How real are those divisions? What do they actually mean in practice in terms of in terms of the attitude towards the JCPOA, the United States, Israel? Can you tell us something about that? Sure. Um, look, there are different um, shades of uh, reformists, there are different shades of pragmatists and conservatives. Um, what is very important for me is to, first and foremost, to describe the structure of the Islamic Republic, which is very important before I get to the faction color. Please. Um, in Iran, you have a dual system. You have the deep state and you have the government. The deep state, its official name is revolutionary institutions. And below it, you have Republican institutions. You also refer to the deep state as the regime. These are people who, are, who don't stand for elections like the Supreme Leader uh, or the heads of the IRGC. These are parts of the, the, the regime inside the regime. Their job is to protect the regime from the people and also to, to, to supervise the government. So they're in charge of setting up elections, vetting candidates. Uh, they're in charge of uh, setting foreign policy. They're in charge of actually most of the things that are running the country. So you could see them as, you know, they are the actual owners of the system. They are the most powerful part. So, but, and they happen to be conservative. One level below you have the government, which is uh, represented, rep supposedly representative of the people. Rouhani and others that run for elections, which of course are vetted by the regime, but they're elected by the people and their job is to carry out the wishes of the people. But unfortunately in Iran, what happens is that the government is, turns out to be more subservient to the regime than to the wishes of the people. And this is something that people of Iran are realizing. I mean, they realized it before, but now it's more obvious than ever, which is why in the next presidential election, we could have the lowest turnout in the post-revolution history of the Islamic Republic. People are sick and tired of going to vote and then seeing those who they voted for, uh, they cannot do much because, because the government is much weaker than the regime. And uh, the, it, that creates a lot of uh, uh, frustration. In, within the governments, there have been reformists, there have been such as Mr. Khatami, there was conservatives such as Ahmadinejad, and there's now moderates, Rouhani, all came in, all wanted to change things, even though we don't like some of the things they did or said, especially Ahmadinejad. But somewhere along the line, they hit this huge brick wall, which is the regime. The regime in Iran doesn't let the government do its job, which is that creates a lot of frustration. Uh, and it's creating, you know, the, as I said, the regime usually counts on elections as a very important referendum on its legitimacy. It doesn't matter who people vote for, they want, they just want like if 70% of the people turn up to vote, then they see that 70% of people of Iran voting for the Islamic Republic, mm. not just for a candidate. But now the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic is boring <clears throat> because again, the, the people's choice, as limited as they are, and sometimes uh, as controversial as they are, even they can't do much. So the president, how, the presidential election is every four years? Yeah. And... And who can stand? Because I, I, it's it's not completely open, right? The, the regime that you just described right. vets candidates, right? There is a, the, the regime. The regime controls the political system through the Guardian Council. It's a twelve-member body, so they control who they can say who runs, who can run for elections, and who cannot. Out of those twelve can, people who vet the candidates, six are picked up by Khamenei directly. And six are picked up by the, are chosen by the head of the judiciary, who is also himself appointed by Khamenei. So you can see already a picture emerging here. And they're the ones who vet the candidates. And uh, um, yeah, so they protect the regime that way to make sure that candidates who run in the elections are regime loyalists. They can be reformists, they can be, they can be conservatives, but they are regime loyalists. The regime controls the country's security through the IRGC. You have an army, but you have an IRGC on top of that to make sure that the army and other security institutions cannot rebel against the regime. 
Right. I, I, I argue the, 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 the revolutionary the, guard. Revolutionary guard. And then you have the economy, official economy of Iran. Then you have a shadow economy, which is actually bigger than the official economy. It's like 60% of the economy. And uh, it's not in the hands of the governments, in the hands of the regime to make sure that the economy cannot be used against the regime. So whatever kingdom you have, you have a, there's a, there's a, a shadow uh, ref, there's a shadow organization for every official organization in, in, in Iran, you could say, for every official aspect of the regime. There's an economy and there's a shadow economy. There's a foreign policy and actually the, 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 foreign, the foreign minister in Iran doesn't have much of a say. It's the supreme leaders all, <coughs> oh, sorry, representative uh, to foreign affairs and the supreme leader himself has much bigger say. So the regime who's fearful of a not just an uprising by the people, by, by, but also a, a government that could threaten it, always keeps the government's uh, authority in almost every aspect in check. Mm -hmm. And um, the elections are kept in check through the Guardian Council. So, but wh when we talk about, if we say, for example, as you said, so Rouhani, the current president, is regarded and often described as a moderate or a reformist. I'm not sure what fits him better. But what does that actually mean in terms of his approach? To, does that mean that he's more, because if, if we just hear that and we don't know very much, we think, okay, that means he's more inclined to want to have better relations with the West, for example. Is that, is, is that what it means, really? Let me just talk about the reformists. If you remember Mr. Khatami, if I can put his picture up, I don't know if I can share a screen. Do I yeah, you can. You should be able to share a screen. Um, hang on just one second. Just get this picture. Katami was president in the 90s, right? Correct, from 1997 to 2005. Right. Now, how do I share a screen here? I don't think. Uh, if you go to the bottom, where there's, you could, there's a share screen, you should be able to. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Uh, share a screen, you can see that's a picture here. This is Khatami. Okay. He came to power in 1997. <coughs> Excuse me. As soon as he came to power, he wanted to strengthen Iranian civil society. 70% of Iranians voted for him, seven zero. That's a huge number. That's a number any country could be proud of, even if, you know, not just the Islamic Republic. Why? He wanted to strengthen Iranian civil society. He wanted to give the people of Iran a voice within the Islamic Republic. He wanted to improve relations with the United States. He actually had an interview with Christian Amanpour and he regretted what happened to the American um, uh, uh, hostages. But again, pff, the regime didn't allow it. He wasn't Gorbachev, but he did really did try to change the situation for the people of Iran for the better. You know, what happens in some of these regimes, for example, I know this is not an exact comparison, but if you look at Soviet Union's constitution under Stalin, it gave the average Soviet citizen a hell of a lot more rights that actually that that the Soviet Union actually had, the yeah. Soviet citizen. It afforded him a hell of a lot more rights. The Islamic Republic constitution is not a constitution like the United States, no, but the average Iranian citizen in terms of his rights is afforded a hell of a lot more rights than actually he gets in reality. So Khatami tried to change this and they made life impossible for him. And uh, sorry, one second, just get a bit of hot water. So he tried, so he's a reformist. He tried to actually reform. Mm not overthrow, you, can, you know, the Guardian Council is never going to allow somebody who's going to overthrow the regime to stand for elections. Just, it's maybe it's in my dreams, it is in my dreams, but in reality, it's not going to happen. Rouhani was somebody who didn't want to go as far as the reformists, but he wanted to moderate the regime's policies, not to go around picking fights with everybody, not going around antagonizing everybody, um, reaching a deal with the Americans, to reduce tensions and to focus on the economy. 
Now, people who watch this, they're thinking, oh, my God, what is he going to say next? Is he going to say, you know, is he going to recommend that we invite him to our next cousin, Jacob's Bar Mitzvah? No. This is all, this is all, with, you know, within, uh, within the, rel- this is all relatively speaking. But Rouhani, who had watched how Ahmadinejad was a, just like a, <clears throat> was a bulldozer without a driver, who just gone off. In, on many circumstances, especially during his first term. During his second term, Ahmadinejad actually mellowed. But during his second, so Rouhani wanted to change that to reduce tensions. And two, two organizations didn't let him at the end. One, of course, again, is the regime. And the other one is Trump. By walking out of the nuclear deal, it really weakened him. So, okay, so I want to get to this, the, the nuclear deal. So one of the... Um... The, the, one of the big stories, the big Iran stories of the last uh, sort of couple of months was this leaked interview with the foreign minister, with Zarif. And a lot of what you said, of, of course, was evident from that, right? That the, he right. was complaining about the fact that the real power lay in the hands of the, the IRGC. And, the, the IRGC is the regime. Right, right, not right. Not the government. Right. And um, and he also, uh, I don't know whether he said it expressly or whether it was implied that there was some, there was there were serious differences of approach and opinion about the, um, the, the desirability of going back into the JCPOA. Is, is, there, is that the case that Rouhani and Zarif want to go into the deal and there are others in the regime that don't want it? Is that accurate? Correct. Correct. It is accurate. Um, it is accurate. I think majority of the people of Iran, first of all, they don't have a say over the nuclear program. You know, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting, it's the hay fever season. Majority of people of Iran don't have a say. The Iranian nuclear program is probably the biggest white elephant in the history of uh, Iran, if not in the Middle East. First of all, I think every country has a right to have nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. I'm not, we are not the lords of anybody. We're not lording it over anybody else. Every country has a right to have a nuclear program, okay? But is it top priority for the people of Iran? No. Is it, do they have a say over it? No, not really. Um, not much, not much at all. Is the cost transparent? Hell no. Um, so, you know, Rouhani and Zarif, I think, yeah, they're, they, wanted, they, were in charge, they wanted to reduce tensions with the U.S. because there's a very famous um, article, I'm sorry, there's a very, very famous saying um, that Zarif, a statement he made in front of a group of IRGC officers. Now, you know, in Iranian political terms, this is, uh, this is, of, this is like an earthquake. Okay, for, for the average person who just reads the, not average, I mean, the people who just read the newspapers and everything, and then they're not living and sniffing Iran like people like me in the news because we are so into it. Um, it doesn't, maybe it's not be much, but what he said was amazing. He told, it's not just what he said, it's who he said it to. He said it to a group of IRGC officers. He said, the biggest enemy of Iran is not America. It is not Israel. The biggest enemy of Iran is inflation, it's unemployment, it's, it's drought. Iran is facing a huge drought problem. This wasn't soon after he came to power. And uh, look, um, first of all, I have to be honest here. I said that uh, Trump weakened him by walking out of the nuclear deal. I actually have to qualify that by saying that Ro- the hardliners, the regime already started weakening Rouhani after the nuclear deal. Why? There are two things the Islamic Republic doesn't want with the United States when it comes to the United States. There are two extremes it does not want to go to because it sees both of them as equally dangerous. So it has to be between these two extremes. On the one end of the extreme is war. The Islamic Republic does not want to go into direct war with the US because it's going to get throttled. But the other extreme is that the Islamic Republic does not want peace with the United States. I know it's difficult for some people to think Obama was on his hands and knees begging Iran and it's, it was ultimately the Iranian regime who did not want to have peace with Obama. The Islamic Republic of Iran, ladies and gentlemen, this is very important in its doctrine of security, sees the reason why the Soviet Union 
despite its thousands of nuclear weapons and tens of thousands of aircraft, the reason why it fell at the end was because of American soft power. They believe, this is the, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, quoting the IR, Khamenei's representative in the IRGC. This is somebody who was very close to Khamenei. He said the reason the Soviet Union fell apart was because the moment it stopped being a revolutionary state and started improving with their relations with the Americans, the Americans came and started permeating the minds of Soviet, average Soviet citizen ideas such as free market, human rights, democracy, and that led to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. This is what happens if you have peace with America. And this is why they don't, you know, after, after uh, the nuclear deal, Obama wanted to expand relations and wanted to cooperate with Iran. Khamenei said, stop, that's it. We're not doing anything else. We're not doing anything else. Um, so yes, so I have to say also, Rouhani was, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, weakened much more by Trump leaving the deal, but he was already weakened as a result of the deal because the regime in Iran was very worried that a nuclear deal with America had really improved America's image among the people of Iran, thus making it easier for America to launch a successful soft war against uh, uh, Iran and to overthrow it. You know, they're like the Chinese and the Russians. They're also the same, the Chinese and the Russians. They look at what happened in Georgia, the color revolution, they, they look at what happened in Ukraine, and they, they are very worried about the spread of ideology, which is why the Iranian regime is obsessed with the internet and uh, you know trying to get its messaging right. And you mentioned so you, you you've mentioned that this the differences of approach towards the JCPOA between diff the different factions and also towards um, the United States to some extent. Um, what about I have to say that's within the context that dif differences of opinion of the government at the end don't really matter because it's the regime that sets the policy. Right, 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 right. Um, what about but what I, what about the um, what about the regional policy of Iran and Iran's support for Hezbollah, Iran's support for Hamas, Iran's support for the Assad regime, Iran's support for the Houthis in in Yemen, uh, Iran's of this uh, hostility towards Israel, is that is that is there a consent? Is that sort of is that something where they where you'd basically find a consensus between say the 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 IRGC and figures like Rouhani and Zarif, or is there, or are there nuances there? Paul, we don't like the presence of the Iranian regime in Lebanon and for very good reason and other places. But first and foremost, every country wants to be a regional superpower. I mean, come on, look at the Qataris. It's the uh, um, as they say in Yiddish, this pizza of a little country, and look at how they're playing. Uh, Iran also, Iran, Iranians, uh, you know, um, Iranians see as an Iranian, I can tell you, not just as a country, but also as a civilization, Tamagone Iran, you know, it's like we have a great civilization that expanded the Middle East, and we have a very, we have a right to claim our own influence in the region because we are a player, we've always been a region. So first and foremost, the Shah also expanded Iran's influence. The Shah was financing the Kurdish rebellion against Saddam Hussein with Israel, hmm. and he also took part in, a, he helped the Omani government of Sultan Qaboos, who was fighting a Marxist group's people front for the liberation of Arab Gulf. Um, so the Shah also took part. The main difference is, so the, and also the Shah didn't ask the people of Iran. He just did things. Sure. Um, so the regime also, the people of Iran don't have much of a say over what the regime is doing. But there's a difference. If I can use the very, uh, very uh, simple example, is the price per kilo that the Iranian uh, public has to pay for Iran's foreign policy. The Islamic Republic's, the price per kilo, basically the cost of Iran's foreign policy under the current regime is infinitely higher than the Shah's, the price per kilo of Shah's foreign policy. Iran's foreign policy in the region, despite the fact that, you know, Iranians would love to see their country as a powerful play in this region, has brought Iran isolation, has worsened relations, has created new enemies. I mean, you don't have to you don't have to agree with Israel. I mean, God Almighty, we don't even agree with ourselves with our many things. But it doesn't justify going around calling for the elimination of Israel, giving weapons and starting. Israel was not Iran's enemy. 
you know, I also don't like this thing that people looked as, at Israel, Iran and Israel before the revolution as a, like a love between a bride and a groom. Whoever bride was and whoever the groom was, I'm not getting into it. No, there were also differences of opinion. But this, what's happening now is psychotic. Like to call for the elimination of Israel, to give weapons. The, the Iranian regime turned Israel into an enemy. You don't have to turn every country if you don't you disagree with to an enemy. God Almighty, the Turks, look, look, look at Erdogan. He's an anti-Semite. He is a vicious little anti-Semite, okay? But he still does business with us. He's missed the flights, there's trade. Mm -hmm. So the people of Iran say, okay, so we don't have to agree with Israel or Saudi Arabia, but why are we picking fights with so many countries? So that, I think, and also supporting Bashar al-Assad is just, you know, for, for the things he's done. So the regimes, because of the cost of the of the of the foreign policy of Iran, its its foreign policy is not popular among the people of Iran. Yeah, I remember in the um, the protests that were in Iran. I think I think it was before Corona when the the economy was taking a hit because of sanctions and other things. One of the you you heard at least you at least you could read about. Um, people chanting things about, you know, you know, forget, forget about Lebanon, forget about Palestine. Like, what about us kind of thing? Is that, I mean, is that, how widespread is that kind of view among the Iranian people that there's, that Iran shouldn't, you know, should be focusing more on the needs of ordinary Iranians and not, not sort of this adventurism in, uh, in far flung parts of the Middle East? You know, doing doing surveys in on, in Iran. If you call somebody up in Iran, right. no, 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 no. It's not North Korea. I don't want to say this. I don't sure. want people to get the wrong impression. If you call somebody up and you ask them, "Are you happy with the performance of the president?" In Iran, you can discuss that. You can say, "I don't like Rouhani." People stay and they don't get arrested. Again, the regime is untouchable, but the government is touchable. So you call up somebody and you say, "Do you agree with Mr. Rouhani's inflation policy?" No. Yes whatever. How has this been in his performance on foreign policy? Yes, good, bad, whatever, etc, etc, etc. But there are some things that people know it's off topic. You cannot really discuss it, like relations with Israel. Because they know you could get arrested. For example, there was an Iranian laborer, his name was Sattar Beheshti. I think he produced one blog page saying why, you know, showing poverty in Iran and uh, showing uh, money going, you know, into other parts of the Middle East, including Palestine and Lebanon. He was arrested and tortured to death. Why is the Iranian regime so fearful of people who want to criticize Israel policy? If its policy was popular, it would have nothing to fear. So the Iranian regime knows that its policies is are, are um, are very unpopular. Look, from my understanding, and this, I have to tell everybody online here, I didn't do a survey on this. There's some things where you can't call up people in Iran and say about issues that are very sensitive, like Israel, like the regime, are you happy with the IRGC's intervention in the government? Oh my God, and there's a call, you know, uh, the end of a call if you wanted one. So on those things, I don't know. But what I can say from my observations, from the, reg the way regime reacts, and the, from Iranians who left Iran and are in the EU, most people don't care about Gaza. Most people don't care. Um, and there's a growing minority in Iran who actually support Israel. Yeah, because the regime has mistreated the people of Iran so badly that whoever the regime supports, people support the other side. <laughs> right. Whoever, whatever the regime. And the, there are people within talk shows in Iran who discuss this phenomenon. That these people in Iran are doing davka to anything that the Islamic Republic supports or wants. So yes, that's one of those issues. I think there's a growing minority. Um, I, I meet people in, uh, in Europe, um, also foreign diplomats who, who deal, dealt with Iran uh, before and they say, you know, uh, it's just unbelievable. Some of some of the Iranians they meet, they could be, they could be members of Likud. They were, 
I don't know if we are. all the Likud watches before you start getting out the 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 the, the, the sweets. It's, they don't know much about Israel, but if the Iranian regime says Israel is bad, they say Israel must be great. The Iranian regime says Netanyahu is terrible. They think, oh my God, look, we love Netanyahu. So there's a growing minority, but you know, in Iran, life is so hard. Life is very hard. Um, you have high inflation. You have bad management of the country. Look, I'll tell, I'll give you this. If the Iranian regime managed to do what to Iran's economy, what the Ch- Chinese communist regime, which is very oppressive mm. to the Chinese economy, I think there will be a much higher tolerance of the regime within Iran. Right. But even on that, they're complete nincompoons. You know, the way they manage the economy, um, even a first year economy students would say, what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? There's a mafia on everything, you know, in Iran. Is a word called, you know, it's an English word, Sultan. Okay, Sultan, you know, a Sultan like a king. Every industry has a king, has a Sultan. It can be from the building industry to the burial, to the burial sector. What, is, what does it mean where every, where these sectors have a Sultan? It means there's a mafia. Mm. There's a capo de tutti in every one of these industries, and that's the Sultan. So, um, that's another, there's a lot of, you know, the, the Iranian economy is very close. That's another reason why, remember I told you the regime doesn't want to have war or peace. They don't want peace with the US because if there's peace and all of a sudden the Iranian consumer can buy nice American cars instead of the fakakta cars that they make in Iran, which, you know, you wouldn't even give it to your, you know, it's terrible car. And it's also bloody expensive um, and terrible service. Um, um, so, you know, then people would buy the nice car that's produced in Iran by foreign companies. But so that's why the regime doesn't want it. Right. So, okay, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm, I'm going to turn to questions from, from, from the audience. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask again people to write questions in. Um, the, uh, we talked about the, so the president, um, there's elections to come from what you've said it doesn't, it's not going to make a huge difference who's elected. But of course, the real power, as you've indicated, lies with the Supreme Leader. And the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, is not a young man, and I believe not a particularly well man. He's been um, dying for the last 12 years already. Oh, really? <laughs> okay, so so you could, so it might be that this question is, is that you don't regard this question as, 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 as uh, so relevant, but that you can tell me. Is... <laughs> Is there any possibility for any change in direction on any of these issues it, with a new supreme leader, a replacement for uh, once uh, Khamenei dies? You know, when it comes to when it comes to predicting the future in the Middle East, you need humility and humiliation. You need to have one and be prepared for the other, because it's a very difficult region to predict what's going to happen. But from where I'm sitting with at this time, it's unlikely that we're going to see somebody who is going to bring a massive change to Europe, who's going to bring a major change. Um, I don't think Khamenei would choose someone who's going to bring too much of a change. I hope I'm wrong, but I just don't see it. Um, you know, um, I started doing some research into Khamenei himself and the first foreign policy speech he was going to give after Khomeini died, everybody was waiting. Is there going to be change? Is there going to be nothing? Nothing. Khomeini, Khomeini wasn't going to choose somebody who, who, who would risk peace or war with America. And one of the ways also, this comes back to Israel, one of the ways the regime makes sure there's never peace with America is by following its Israel policy. Because it knows as long as it follows its policies regarding Israel, no U.S. president is really going to be able to do to to. Let's just take the the, the the scenario. Yes, Iran made peace with Obama. Ten days later, the Iranian regime starts, uh, uh, you know, denying the Holocaust, giving money to weapons to Hamas, Hezbollah. How how durable is that going to be? Right. So um. Right. I don't see it. I don't okay. See it. And and just to clarify. The supreme leader, the new supreme leader, is chosen by the current supreme leader. Yes, so so Khamenei has already. There is a all... body. There's a regime body called the Assembly of Experts. The 86 people, all uh, they are um, very. Um, they are. 
They are clerics who are, have reached a level where they can give interpretations on Islamic ruling. I don't know if you guys are aware at home, but one of the major differences between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, which actually makes Shia Islam theoretically potentially more progressive than Sunni Islam, is that in Shia Islam you can give protect you can give new interpretations of existing Islamic law depending on the time and the place. So in, in, in Islamic law, for example, on contraception was given a thousand years ago. You can't have contraception. That was back in Saudi Arabia in the middle of a desert. Islam needed to grow. So back at Zaman and Makan, based on the time and the place, there was one interpretation then. Fast forward to 1990, Iran, the regime looks at its population explosion and gives a new interpretation that yes, you can have contraception. So, uh, so all these people, that's called ijtihad, the power of ijtihad, to give the power, interpretation. This really, you know, uh, this is one of the differences between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, because the Sunni Islam, I understand, is not that easy. The other difference with Sunni Islam, of course, is, you know, Shia like their shrines. <coughs> Purity <coughs> Sunnis, they hate their shrines. They, they see it as an adult, you know, you're worshipping, I, I, idol worshipping. But to get back to the point, there is a there's an 86 member body called the assembly of experts and one of their jobs is to officially to pick the next supreme leader but in reality it's very likely that the that the supreme leader will be chosen by a small group of people including the supreme leader himself and sent to the to the assembly of experts for final and official approval approval okay okay so let's get to a couple of questions that we've had um one uh, relates a little to what i've just said uh, about the possibility of change. Um, is there any chance, Annie asks, is there any chance whatsoever for a grassroots revolution for regime change? Annie, majority of the people of Iran don't like the regime. But majority of this people, many people in Iran are scared witless. This is a very cruel regime that does not think twice about arresting and torturing. And also another factor is that there's no leader. Who are people going to die for? You just don't, you can't have a revolution for the sake of revolution. People don't want anarchy. Um, and I think these are the two factors that we, 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 it's unlikely that we're going to see a massive, we could see big demonstration. Hey, by the way, I hope I'm wrong, by the way. I hope next year you're in Tehran and then Annie tells me, Mayor, you don't know what the hell we're talking about. And I'll say, Lechaim to that and we'll drink a, a nice glass of wine, not Manisharitz. Um, but, you know, um, currently it's not very, it's not very, um, you know, people are, and who are they going to risk their life for? In 1979, there was a leader, there was a, somebody that could rally around, but right now there isn't anyone. So um, revolution, I don't think so, but uprisings, you know, once every three or four or five years, yes, perhaps. Okay. Um... Uh, Jacqueline asks about um, why does Iran, I, I, the question is really, given what you've described, the, the, the way you have the regime and the deep state, which has the real power, um, why is there even, what's the point of even having this, this, uh, elected, this elected government? Why is that part of the system if ultimately it doesn't have any power? What's the pur what purpose does it serve the regime? First of all, it gives legitimacy to the Islamic Republic because it, because it can say, look, uh, we have a system that's based on the will of the people. OK, you, you could dispute how much it is based on the will of the people, but, um, but uh, it's something that's very important for the legitimacy of the Islamic Republic. And the Islamic Republic does take its legitimacy seriously. Um, and the other is that, look, um, it's great, isn't it, when you can have somebody, when you do all the things, but there's somebody else there who's there to take the blame. It's wonderful, isn't it? The regime does all this terrible stuff to the, uh, to the economy, to foreign policy. But as the old saying goes, can I use the word shit? Shit okay. rolls downwards. You know, it rolls downwards. So the regime makes all the problems and who takes the blame? The government. You have a government. Go to Khamenei says, you know, if there's problem with the with, with the economy, don't come to me. Even though it's it's, it's the regime that controls 60% of the revolution. You have a government, you go and deal with it. 
Why are you coming to me for? You've chosen this person. That's their job. Right. And nobody's going to say to Khamenei, well, sir, you know, it is a... <laughs> that ain't going to happen. So, um, you know, this is something that's been established since the beginning of the revolution. You know, the, excuse, <coughs> the first prime minister of Iran, Mehdi Bazargan, he said... <laughs> He was a prime minister. He said, being a prime minister in Iran is like having a knife, but the blade is in the hands of someone else. <laughs> you can't cut me. With the blade is in the hands of the God regime. They are the ones who can cut. I'm just holding the blade. It really is, uh, you know, it enables the regime to deflect blame for many other things that are going wrong in the country, which is why Mr. Zarif said all those things in a private chat. Of course, he knew one day it would be exposed, but he didn't think it's going to be exposed while he's in office. <laughs> I think it was most probably exposed by the IR, by the regime, because in Iran, as I said, there's a shadow of everything. You have a Ministry of Intelligence, and then you have the IRGC intelligence, which uh, keeps the Ministry of, you know, makes sure that the Ministry of Intelligence shadows everything that the Ministry of Intelligence does. Whatever the Nazis had also, they had the Abwehr. I don't know if you guys, uh, the German military intelligence, and then you had the SD, which is a very long German name, don't ask me to pronounce it. That was the uh, Nazi party intelligence to keep yeah. over, watch over them. So um, I think it was exposed by them because Zarif could have been a very, well, relative to others, he could have brought, you know, he could have uh, been a, perhaps a um, popular uh, presidential candidate compared to others. But now yeah. that's just putting, and that's just putting a bullet in, in the brain of his, uh, chances of uh, presidential uh, future because that's over now okay right um so there's a couple of questions here from shmuel i'm gonna put them both to you what is about the economy and the question is if if the regime is mismanaging the economy so badly as you describe how much longer can they go on like this mm -hmm. before a complete economic collapse and i'll add to that also the impact of sanctions um, and the second question that he asks is... Well, I, 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 just one at a time, one at a time. All right, go on, just economy. Economy. Um, apparently, Iran has access to... <coughs> excuse me. Is it four or 14? One of those. I think it's four. Let's just take the high number. $14 billion of its money, of its foreign reserve. It has much more bigger foreign reserves, maybe more than 80 or 90 billion at least. But it has access to only 14 billion. Um, that's a low number. But the regime continues, you know, uh, by hook and by crook. And uh, it hopes that people don't rise up. And when, when they do, it, it suppre suppresses the, the demonstrations. But um, for now, they're, they're, they're scrimping and saving in any way they can get money. They're now they're into Bitcoin. They're mining so much Bitcoin that their power outages in parts of Tehran sometimes. It's crazy. Oh, yeah, we try with the Chinese. Um, and the sanctions have really hurt the regime. Um, this is their incentive. This is their incentive to go back into the JCPOA, right? It is one of their incentives. They also don't want to lose face. Well, you know, um, Trump really humiliated them. Um, as much as uh, I don't like this regime, the way Trump left the deal, that was, you know, if Trump was going to run America for eight years, maybe he would have had a chance of getting the Iranian regime back to the, the table. But <coughs> excuse me, within four years, that's not going to happen. And the regime felt very wounded. They said, OK, look, we kept the deal. And according even to the uh, Mossad documents that was brought out of Tehran, the regime after the nuclear deal had not broken it. Before the nuclear deal, they'd done a hell of a lot of stuff. I mean, in the early 2000s. Um, but after the nuclear deal, they were keeping it. They were keeping the deal. So um, this is why also the regime wants to save face. But again, is the Iranian, does that really uh, impact the Iranian voter? No, majority, again, most Iranians are... When you have high inflation, when you have a high, very high rate of uh, COVID, um, when uh, you know life is unstable, you have you can't be uh, sure about your future. This is why there's a collapse in the Iranian uh, uh, birth birth rates. Uh, sorry, pre fertility rates. Right. And when we left Iran, it was like five kids per woman in '87. Now it's like 1.8. It's huh. not even replacement. Wow. It's like. Um, 
the replacement is 2.1 per woman fertility rate, right? So much so that uh, one, scene, one regime official recently said, look, we need to have more children. Who's going to have their hand on the button of the missiles in the future if we don't have enough children? As if you know, that's the reason to have kids, to, to have your hands on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the missiles. But it is something that is um, of concern to the regime. They might, have to, they might have to reinterpret the uh, reinterpret the ban on contraception. No, you can re reinterpret. No, actually, they are doing actually, Paul. That's a very good point. They are now. They're reducing. Oh, the I was joking. <laughs> okay. yeah. But you know, um, Iranian society is falling apart. You know, because of the poverty, because of their life is becoming so difficult. You know, people are. It happens in every society. You know, I don't know if you have any British visit any British viewers. Uh, in the 90s and then too early, before the Good Friday Agreement, if you compare people from Belfast to the people from Dublin, they were both Irish, okay, different sides, but you know, the people in Belfast were usually more aggressive, right? Compared to the people from Dublin who were more chilled out. Why? Because people in Belfast lived under war conditions. And Iranians have been living under economic war conditions for many years. So, you know, there's a high rate of accidents on the roads, there's burglary, there's crime, there's rising crime. Um, this couple were recently arrested for killing and then chopping up their son to little pieces because apparently he was having homosexual relations with other men. Um, again, this has got to be, I mean, he's standing for trial. That's it. Apparently the same couple killed their daughter and their son-in-law, whatever they didn't approve. It's Iran is a very, you know, it's becoming, People who leave Iran, they say it's not becoming live. It's it's not livable anymore in that country. Mm -hmm. I I I met an Iranian Olechadash who left Iran a couple of years ago, from the city of Shiraz. You know, he's in Israel. He said he loved Shiraz. He said he's he's a young guy, by the way, like 24 years old. He said the people are very nice. Life in Iran was very good, but now I only left Iran. He said because. Um, it's not livable anymore. And he came to Israel, by the way, because during Trump, Trump closed down the processing center for Iranian immigrants, all immigrants to America, including Iranian Jews to Vienna. So at that, during Trump, the only country people could come to, to Iranian Jews would come to was Israel. Mm -hmm. And as nice as Israel is, we all know that not everybody wants to live here. Not all Jews want to immigrate here. Some people pr prefer to immigrate to other countries. So, but anyway, he's here and I wish him all the best. But, you know, you know, I speak to people who go back and forth to Iran. It's just, it's really turning into a society where it's the, it's the test of the, it's the strength of, of your muscle, your financial and or muscle that determines who you are rather than who you, <coughs> who you really are. And it's, it's really sad to see. This is why less and less Iranian women are getting married. Um, they don't believe in marriage anymore. There's less, and also this is why a growing number of men are using opium. I mean, some Iranian parents, before they give the hands of their daughter to a guy, they ask for a urine test. They want to make sure the guy is not using opium. Hmm. You know, people are losing their minds in Iran. If I lived in Iran, I would be going crazy. So people are turning to opium, especially men. Well, um, okay. Let's uh, go to a different point. Um, Shaheen asks about the peace agreements or normalization agreements between Israel and the, uh, the Gulf, the two Gulf states um, last year. Uh, how do you think those agreements can affect the for or can or will affect Iran's foreign policy? Um, First of all, I'm Iranian, so there's no such thing as Gulf. There's only the Persian Gulf. Sorry, the Persian Gulf. The, the Gulf is a car. You have the Volkswagen Gulf. Maybe if you are, unless you're talking about the car. <laughs> I should have been. I should have really been more. I, both of the Iranians. I should have um, been more sensitive. I'm sorry, Mayor. No, it's just actually, Paul. I have to be honest with you. There is a very concerning, and I'm telling you, rise of racism. Iran towards Islam, really, and against Arabs. Hmm. Um, yeah, you hear people saying this stuff, and it really, really is like makes the hair on the back of your head, you know, back of your neck stand up. Like middle class people, 
who, you know, who curse the Arabs for bringing Islam. Of course, this is all wrong. God forbid, you know, I'm not an anti-Arab or anti-Islam. God forbid. I have tremendous religion for, to respect for the Islamic religion and for our Arab neighbors. We don't get along always, but, you know, I respect our neighbors very much. They are neighbors. But in Iran, it's like this. It's also a bit of, it's a lot of lazy thinking. People try to find, you know, who's responsible for the fact that since 1979, China's going like this, Iran's going like this. Turkey's, go, every time they go to Turkey, Ankara is a new hotel. There's a new skyscraper where in Iran you can't breathe because it's so much pollution and so much going. So who's responsible? So there's a lot of lazy thinking. It's, Aha, it's the Arabs. They forced Islam upon us. They invaded Iran. And the, the moment Iran stopped being a Zoroastrian state is when Iran started going backwards. First of all, the Iranian, the, the Islamic clergy has a lot to answer for. And I'm saying this as a Jew first and foremost, because they're responsible for much of the anti-Semitism which my father faced and my family in Isfahan. It was hell on earth in Isfahan until the father of the Shah and then the Shah came and started making the situation better. Um, and also they're very corrupt in Iran that they, you know, they, they were a force against modernity and progress of Iran for sure. But it's very lazy thinking to think, oh, it's all of the, it's not true, first of all. Not all Iranians were forced to become Islam. Some of them willingly became Muslims, okay? Because when the Arabs invaded, they introduced, for example, tax laws. If you're Muslim, you don't pay tax, et cetera, et cetera. So they made it easier to become Muslim. But it's really, it, it really does, uh, it's really concerning, you know, the level of racism that I see from some Iranians. <coughs> In terms of the Persian Gulf countries, I think, look, first of all, I don't think it was noted that much by the people of Iran. They, you know, those who noted it from what I can see in social media say, well, look, these Arab countries have relations with Israel, then why the hell not us? I mean, they're the ones who had war with Israel before, not us. We only were at war in Israel after the revolution. Um, but it has created concern for the Islamic Republic, which is why we see the Islamic Republic has agreed to talks with the Saudis now. The Iranian regime was worried about don't forget the Iranian regime was uh, supporting the Houthis. But now after seeing put the potential that um, um, Saudi Arabia and Israel could, uh, you know, if uh, King Salman dies and his son Mohammed bin Salman takes over, um, it is possible. Again, I'm not a Saudi expert, so with that caveat, but it is possible, you know, King Salman right now is not, doesn't want peace with Israel for his own considerations. Mm. Uh, but when he passes on, his son might do. His might, the son might say, the hell with this. You know, um, they have, you know, they look at what's happening in Syria, um, which is why, you know, I, I think they are, they are noting uh, what is happening. I just hope we're just going to come off. I know it's a bit of a digression, but I have to say this. Um, I really hope that we don't come out of this current round of fighting with our relations worse than with the US. I don't know if you are a Republican supporter, if you're American or you support the Democrats. Uh, it's, you know, it's not good to lock horns with, uh, with the Biden administration over, over Gaza. Of course, we have to protect our security always. But if we lock horns unnecessarily and it damage our relationship, this is exactly what the Iranian regime wants. And I hope we're going to be smarter than that. Okay, um, so so I the I mentioned that uh, Shmuel had a couple of questions, and I asked one. Oh. The second question was, so you've talked about the the difference, of course, between the regime and the government. But he says, if the government is loyal to the regime and also ultimately subservient to the regime, isn't criticizing the government effectively criticizing the regime at the same time? Like if you're if you if you're allowed to criticize the government, you said, but not the regime. So if you are criticizing the government, the elected government, are you not also indirectly criticizing the regime? Uh, who said that? What's the name of the Shmuel? Shmuel, you're thinking like an Iranian. Yes, a lot of people in Persia we say we, we there's a proverb that says saying it to the door so that the wall hears it. Okay, so when people sometimes curse the government, they really mean the regime. Um, yes, look, look. Um, if, for example, there are two, let me just share the screen here. One second. There are two candidates in Iran. 
um, in the election. One of them is Ibrahim Raisi. Um, why is he not? Why am I not seeing him? Um, let me just put a picture. One of them is Ibrahim Raisi. This guy, can you see his picture? Not a big picture, but Ibrahim no, Raisi. It's, it's still, it's still on, it's still on Khatami. Oh, oh dear. Um, hang on, one second. Let me just stop. Sharing. One is Ibrahim Raisi, is mm -hmm. one of them. These are the two make the other candidates as well. Um, and then you have Ali Larijani. Can you see his picture? It's still on Raisi at the moment. Raisi, okay, so I'll stop share and I'll come back to Larijani. Uh, so Larijani is Larry Johnny's the current speaker of the parliament, right? Parliament, that's right. Larijani, there we are. That's Larijani. Raisi is closer to, the, to Khamenei without doubt. I mean, some people even say that Raisi could be the um, next replacement for Khamenei, successor. Again, we don't know. It's top, 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 top secret in Iran who's going to replace Khamenei. No one knows except a small group of people. If Raisi becomes president because of his good relations with Khamenei, it's possible that he will do more. Look, Ahmadinejad was elected in 2005. Because of his good relations with Khamenei, he, did, he could do a hell of a lot more than Khatami. But at the end of the day, you reach a stage where there is always conflict. Even those who are very close to the regime, when they take the position in the government, always, there's always a clash at the end. Yeah. Because the person becomes popular or he wants to have his own base of support. He wants to do things. So he does it at the beginning with the help of the regime. But at some stage, he also wants to do things that may not be popular with the regime, but is popular with the people in order to expand his standing. So, yes, I mean, if Raisi gets elected, it's likely that he'll be able to do more than Larry Johnny, even though he's also close to Khamenei, but Raisi is closer. <coughs> Excuse me. But somewhere along the line, it's going, it's going to be, you know, it, it ends up, it ends up in, an, in, a, in, in a fight, you know, in a big argument. Every single Iranian president who served on the Khamenei has fallen out with him. First of all, Rafsanjani is believed that he was killed. I mean, he went for a swim, he came out and he, then he had, then he died. And, and then, you know, uh, the, according to his daughter, the level of radioactive, radioactive traces on his body was 10 times the normal rate when he was pulled out of the uh, pool. God knows what they did in the pool or whatever, in the water, I don't know. But, you know, there is this theory that Rafsanjani didn't just die, he was killed. Mm. Khatami, they, they can't even publish his picture anymore in Iran because he's fallen out with so many parts of the regime. Ahmadinejad, and this is the craziest one. This is, I mean, this is the most flipping entertaining of all. Ahmadinejad was... The dog, he was the love child of the deep state of the regime. Okay, if different parts of the regime got together and made a child, he would be Ahmadinejad. He was from the regime. After five years in power, four years in power, he went for elections, there were demonstrations, and then he started going against regime organizations. Today, he is the most vocal anti, not he doesn't mention Khamenei, but he talks about the system. He's the most anti-establishment politician within Iran. And he's a conservative. He's not a reformist. He's gone further in criticizing the establishment than Khatami got, did. And Khatami is a reformist. And according to at least one poll, Ahmadinejad is very popular because he speaks against the system. Um, and Ahmadinejad is running again, right? Shmuel. Yeah, but he might be, he's probably going to be disqualified. Ah, okay, okay. Just think about it. Ahmadinejad, somebody who, whose relationship with Khamenei, Khamenei described as like father and son, might be disqualified by the Guardian Council. 
because the regime is so unwilling to allow change below, that people turn into extremes. You would have, you know, if you would have told me that in 2021, Ahmadinejad is going to be saying that people at the top, wink, wink, nudge, not say no more Khamenei, of course, are getting Pfizer vaccines while everybody's getting all the other, you know, uh, Russian or Chinese. What are you, crazy? Yeah. Um, but, you know, the arrested is, uh, he really is, he really is going against a lot of people within the regime. Interesting. And the question is, why is he not arrested? He should have been arrested long ago. The regime believes that arrest is, I'm just quoting somebody who made this example. It's not my example. He said arresting Ahmadinejad is like setting fire to the door of the mosque. Okay. What happens if you set fire to the door? Then the rest of the mosque will catch fire. Because Ahmadinejad was so close, he was so much part of the regime, the, within the fabric, that if you arrest him, you're undermining the whole system because you're arresting somebody who was... But the way he's carrying on, he's got a big mouth, that guy. Um, I think maybe one day we'll, we'll see him in jail. Interesting. I'm telling you, he's a lying charlatan, but he really knows how to speak. He really knows how to speak. He really knows the words to use, the tones to use. He gets people really excited. Um, you know, people still line up outside his house to give him letters, to get things done. It's, which is amazing because he was such a terrible president. Okay. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, we, we're out of questions as well. Um, I had, I actually had one last question, Mary. Do you have time for one last question? Sure, sure, sure. sure. So one thing that hasn't been asked, and I think it's relevant um, for this audience, um, you mentioned in passing this, uh, this young man who made Aliyah recently uh, from Shiraz. Um, can you tell us something about the Jewish community in Iran, which of course you're from, um, and how the regime... Um, and indeed, the 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 government, the maybe even perhaps more moderate forces in the government, relatively moderate, um, how they relate to the Jewish community. As long as Iranian Jews don't have anything to do with Israel, they're fine. They don't come to Israel and go back to Iran. That was actually somebody who did that. Came and made Aliyah, didn't like it, went back to Iran, they put him into jail. Actually, before they didn't do that, I've heard of people who've gone back to Iran and they didn't do anything to them. But now it's becoming, you know, that if you go to Israel and you come back, they put you in jail. If you want to travel to Israel to visit your family before, you could have done that. The Iranian Jews were coming back and forth, no problem. But within, since like four years ago, they need to ask permission from the Iranian representative to the parliament, who then probably checks within the security establishment and then says, yes, you can go or you can't go. If they get approval to go to Israel, then they come and they return. If they don't get approval and they return to Iran, then they're going to be in trouble. Other than that, look, um, there are shuls, um, there are uh, kosher, kosher uh, um, restaurants, there's kosher food. I, I got to taste the kosher salami from Tehran three years ago at a hotel in Turkey. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but it tasted disgusting. Um, but there is kosher food. Um, um, you know, people talk on the phone all the time, uh, WhatsApp relatives talk it to each other. Um, they just don't talk about Mr. Khamenei or the political situation. Is, is, there more, is there more suspicion? Would you say that the regime is more has more interest in what the Jews are saying than what the regular population is saying? Do they see them as, you know, potential Zionist agents or things like that or, or not so much? There have been some remarks recently that, for example, Qasem Soleimani, before he died, he was keeping the Iranian Jewish community on the special watch. Mm. I don't know how true that is or whatever, but generally uh, they're okay. Look, they haven't left Iran because for financial reasons, mainly, and also because they feel at home. It's not easy to leave Iran. There's many yeah. divorces, you know, uh, people leave, their families fall apart. The position of the husband in Iran, doesn't matter if you're Jew or Muslim, we're all the same. We all brought up within the same culture. The position of the husband in Iran compared to the wife, and I hope you can see the difference. When they come abroad, they want to continue it. And the woman says, what the hell? What the hell? I don't have to take this shit. Excuse my French. And then they, ask, they divorce the man. 
I don't have to listen, put up with your crap, you know, do this, do that, don't speak to this, do that. What is this? This is not Iran. So they divorced it. So the guys in Iran watched. They said, what am I, crazy? What am I going to go abroad so that my wife starts speaking back to me and starts undermining my authority? No, they stay, you know, and some of them stay. And and also economic reasons, you know, they, they, in Iran, they own many, pro- numerous Jews own many, numerous properties and shops. If they sell it and they come abroad, what are they going to do? And also there's another factor. Unlike the Iraqi Jewish community, our, our, the Iraqi Jewish community was very well educated because the British colonized Iraq and they used the Jews in administrative positions. So the Jews were given, but in art, you know, Iran only got its first university in 1935. So majority of Iranian Jews, the level of education was not high because we, people were into business, mm. shops especially, okay? Those Iranian Jews who made, who moved to the US before 2001, generally did well having shops and businesses. Those who moved to US after 2001, including my uncles, they're really suffering. I'm talking about breadline stuff here. Why? What happened in 2001? In 2001, China joined the WTO. Suddenly you have this huge Chinese imports into the US Then you have the advent of the internet. Having a shop and selling stuff in a shop is, you know, as we can see, so many Iranians who left Iran afterwards who were, who were, who had their own shops in Iran and businesses, they're really suffering. Many of them live on welfare. Many of them live on welfare. But I think if the situation in Iran, if the status quo continues, I think more and more Iranians will leave. How, Jews, how many Jews are there in Iran? Before the revolution, immediately, I think it was 100,000. Then when I left in 87, it was like 25,000. There was a census in 2006 that said there were like seven and a half thousand Jews in Iran, 2006. Whoa. The number is probably like, likely to be less now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, Mayor Javadanfa, thank you so much for a very enlightening and colorful uh, explanation, description of Iran with its... Uh, with its uh, trials and tribulations and the the, the divisions within within the government and the regime, um, I think it's very um, it's very tempting. I think for people looking outside to see it as a as a monolith, partly because we see it as as an enemy country, um, partly because it's a, an authoritarian regime, um, and it's very useful to, for you to have painted this picture of of the of the um, divisions and the the nuances within it so thank you very much for that thank you for your time uh thank you everyone uh, for joining us um if you are not on my mailing list and would like to be on it email me paul g at bagancenter.org.il um and you can also find out more um on the Bagan center facebook page and english website and i will see you all soon so just one thing, I'm going to put my Twitter handle. And oh, please do, yeah. Run. Um, my Twitter handle is MeirJA. If you look okay. at this up on Twitter, at MeirJA, I'm, I'm on Twitter also. So I tweet about Iran and Israel. And of course, before I go, I'd like to, here's to the memory of the great Menachem Begin. Um, I'm more to the left of Mr. Begin, but uh, he's uh, he was a real, he's in, in terms of, his caliber as a man, as his honesty and his love for the state of Israel and the fact that he put the state of Israel above anything else. Um, I think his qualities are sorely missed today when I look at Israeli politics and may his memory be a blessing. Thank you very much, Mayor. That's a wonderful uh, way to end. And uh, I thank you all again. Thank you, Mayor. And everyone have a good day.